services today. Those of you that are here in person, those that are watching online, guys, thanks for being here. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and so we're great, grateful for this day. Hey, do us a quick favor. I want everybody, everybody, 100%, man, pull out your phone right now. Do this for us, okay? I want you to go to our Facebook page. I want you to share this live feed. Man, right now we are live and we have the opportunity literally with like the click of a button. Now this is how easy this is. With the click of a button, literally this message that is going to be so important today, man, today's subject is so important. And with the click of a button, literally thousands of people can hear God's word. Come on, how many think that's pretty easy, right? All right, so here, so everybody, pull out your phone, go to our Facebook page, and you can just simply share this live feed because we want to connect to those that you are connected to. And hey, with that, can you help me welcome all of our first-time guests today? Guys, if you are new to Merge, we welcome you. We thank you for being a part. And, man, we want to connect with you. One of the ways that we do that is through this Connect card. You'll see it on the seat back in front of you. You can also go to merge.church and fill it out there. It's just a simple little thing that you will fill out just to give us an opportunity to make a quick contact with you just to say thank you so much for being here. Hey, we got a few quick announcements this morning. First of all, don't forget, next week, man, it's such an important week because it is Merge Circles launch, man. And if you don't know what circles are, they're so awesome, man. It's the small group ministry of our church. It's an opportunity for you to grow in relationship with others within our church, to grow in relationship with Christ. And so, man, we encourage everyone 100% to sign up for a circle. You're going to meet all of our circle leaders next week. There's 12 different circles that you can be a part of. And so make plans to be here for that next week. And then the following week, so two weeks away, we've got growth track, man. And, and this is another thing. Everything that we do, man, we encourage, man, it's important for everybody to go through. And Growth Track is one of those deals that, that everyone, we encourage you to be a part of that. If you haven't been through it, you can sign up at Merge.Church. Growth Track is just an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about our church and for you to get involved in the team, for you to be involved in what's happening here. And so we encourage you to go to Merge.Church and sign up for Growth Track there. And then October the 3rd, everybody say October 3rd. I will be at Merge. Hey, hey, if you said it, you got to be here. You can't be lying. October the 3rd is the fourth birthday of Merge. And man, guys, we're going to do it upright. We're going to celebrate all that God has done. And we're going to celebrate what God is going to do. And here's what I told the first group, man. We're celebrating 
you through this also. Because here's what we realize, man, it's not me or Pastor Jacob or anybody on this stage that has done this. This is you allowing God to use you. And man, so we're going to celebrate together. And so we're so excited about that. October 3rd, make plans to be here. It's going to be such a great time together. Go ahead and stand up with us. We're going to get right back into worship this morning. First way we're going to worship is through our giving. I just want to remind you on your way out, man, you'll see some generosity boxes you can give there. You can give online. You can give through text. Just text the dollar amount to the number 84321, or you can mail your gift in. But, guys, thanks so much for giving, for being a part, for partnering with us in all that we do. Guys, bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to pray and get right back into worship this morning. God, we love you today. God, right now, Lord, in this moment, over these next few minutes, Father, we want to give you the worship that you are so worthy of. And so, Lord, right now, we settle our minds. Lord, we choose to focus our attention on you. God, we choose to give you the worship that you deserve. And so, God, I pray that as we sing these songs, God, that you would be honored And God, we know that your word says that when you are lifted up, God, that you're going to draw all men unto you. And so, God, I thank you for that opportunity to lift you up today. I pray that you would have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church, we sing this song together. He said... Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. You sing that out. Then my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the
come on if you believe that raise your voice this morning you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for he's good. turning it around you turn it for good Ooh, yeah. you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good god you turn it
you today just thankful that we have an opportunity to serve a savior that cares about every part of our lives and that we have an opportunity to say I surrender every bit of it to you God from my finances to my home to my marriage to my kids to my doubts to my fears to my victories to my defeats God you can have all of me not some of me and God in exchange what we're really saying is that we want all of you 
We don't want just some of what you have for us, but we want everything that you have for us. So God, we lay it out and we surrender all to you, knowing that in exchange you will pour out all that you have for us because you are a good and a just and a merciful and a grace-filled God. And we thank you for the opportunity to declare the name of Jesus in this house. And everybody said a great big amen. Come on, give Jesus some praise. And you can grab a seat right where you are. My name is Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us on a rainy holiday weekend. Those are the weekends every pastor looks forward to. Said no pastor ever. Amen. Hey, listen, I'm going to do this different because if, if you're new here, one of the things that you uh, will learn about me and that you need to become probably comfortable with to make this place your home is that we, we believe in a radical authenticity about who we are and, and, and life and all of those things. So can I just, can I be honest with you guys for a moment and tell you that today it has been hard for me to get my energy up and that is not something I normally struggle with. So I'm going to ask you to do me this, stretch your hands towards me and pray for me for just a moment. Can y'all do that for me? Man, Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that's willing to just stretch their hands out on my behalf, that's willing to just lift my hands up. And God, I give you this word, I give you this moment, and God, I pray that you take it, that you use it, that you remove me from the equation, and that you speak clearly and articulately to each and every one of us, and that we would have hearts and minds that are open to receive the fullness of your word and what it is that you have for us. I thank you, give you all the praise and honor, and you're going to pray, amen. Hey, thanks, guys. Come on. You know, one of the reasons that I think most pastors would struggle to say that uh, as they stand behind a pulpit, and that's not a criticism to anybody, but it's because we all have this tendency to worry. Like worry what other people might think or say or feel in a moment of honesty or in a moment of truth, in a moment of revelation that we might share, right? Like, hey, this is where I am in life. And we've been journeying through this series called I'm No Hostage, and we're looking at the book of Philippians, and Paul is writing this this letter to a church that he planted that he cares deeply about. And, and he starts off saying, hey, I want to tell you about what's going on in my life. And I'm thinking he's going to tell me about the jail cell and the food in the bed, but he doesn't. He says, listen, let me tell you, I'm in chains for Christ. And because of it, incredible things are happening. Paul's saying, I'm no hostage to this world. As long as the glory of Christ is shining through my life, it is a win. And so then we started breaking down things that cause us to be held hostage that maybe are difficult to identify. And the first thing we talked about was bitterness, how it will take root in our life and it will keep the glory of Christ from shining through our lives. And last week we talked about pride. And I think pride is such an important topic to talk about in the church because pride leads to all of the other sins in our life. Pride keeps us from drawing into that close relationship that God wants us to be in, that intimate and personal relationship with a Savior. And today, we're going to talk about worry. How many of you would be honest and admit that you worry? Yeah. Like some of you are worried about raising your hand because you're worried about what someone might think or say or feel about you, right? Like we all, we all worry. And in fact, like we worry far too much about far too many things, right? Like, like some of you woke up and, and you worried about the weather and you worried about what you were going to wear and you worried about if you were going to be on time or not and you worried about if your kids were going to be good when you dropped them off and you worried about if they were going to have the snack that you want, right? It's just, it becomes a natural reoccurring theme in our lives, so much so that we don't often stop and recognize that worry can take us hostage and can prevent the glory of Christ from shining through our lives. Jesus talks about it. So does the apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says this, be anxious for nothing. Everyone say nothing. But, that's going to be important later, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I've preached this before, but I want to pause for just a moment. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And when we get to that line, it's easy to be like, for, I shouldn't be anxious about anything. Paul, you don't understand what my week looked like. You don't understand where my marriage is. You don't understand where my finances are. You don't understand the struggle that I'm facing. You don't understand the difficulties of the next month that I have. You, you haven't seen my schedule clearly, Paul. 
And I believe that, that, that the Holy Spirit gives Paul these words in this moment for a reason. He's writing them from a jail cell. None of us can judge Paul's position as he writes this. Can I get an amen? He's writing with joy from a jail cell, and absent this position, these words don't mean nearly as much as they mean when we recognize that Paul's situation is worse than any situation any of us are facing today. You're like, yeah, but you don't know my situation. You, you don't know my struggles. I know you're here. You're not in jail. And you're not soon to be beheaded for crimes that you did not commit. Paul has an opportunity to speak into our lives. Because how many of you know that pride oftentimes causes us to judge the wise counselor that gives the wise advice? If Paul says this and he's like up in the mansion on the cliff overlooking the Greek ocean, right? If, if he's living the good life as he writes this, we're all like, Paul, listen, bro. <laughs> I wouldn't be anxious about anything if I was living your life. I wouldn't have worries if I was, but, but we get to look at it and say, you know what, man, this is a guy sitting in jail, having to write letters to the churches that he's planted. He's given up everything for the cause of Christ, yet he is still writing with joy and says, be anxious for nothing. But worry is a difficult topic, right? Because it's such an everyday part of our lives. So I just want to break worry down as far as we can break it. So let me ask you a few questions about worry. Who of you by worrying can add a single good hour to your life? Who of you can worry so much so that you can extend your life in a positive way? And let me ask the opposite. Who of you has worried so much that you think your anxiety may have actually taken a year or so off of your life? I got two hands up. I've lost two years in the last four years of planting a church. All right? All the worry, all the anxiety, all the anxiousness, all the uncertainty, right? It mounts and it builds. So let me ask you one final question. Will worrying contribute to the thing that you value enough to worry about? Like, Have, have you ever worried about your kids so much that you made their life better? Have you ever worried dollars into your empty bank account? Have you ever worried yourself into the promotion that you so desperately desire? Have you ever worried yourself into that A minus that you needed on the final of the mid, at the end of the semester just to scrape by that class? Have you ever worried your way into the school that you want to be in or into the job that you so desire to have? Have you ever worried your way into a house? You ever worried your way out of a problem of any kind whatsoever? You ever worried your way into a better marriage? Ever worried your way into a more meaningful relationship with Jesus? Worry doesn't actually add any value to our life whatsoever, which is why Paul says be anxious for nothing. It isn't to say that what you're going through isn't serious, and it isn't to say that you shouldn't be concerned, and it isn't to say that your feelings and your realities don't matter. It is to say that even in the midst of your concern and of in the reality, you still don't have to worry. So can I give you just some pastoral advice? Stop. Stop worrying. Just stop. Have you ever had somebody tell you that? When someone tells you to stop worrying, you just worry more, right? Someone tells you to stop worrying and you're like, now I gotta worry about finding a new friend because obviously you don't understand what I'm going through. Now I gotta worry about whether or not I'm articulating clearly my situation and my circumstance because if I, if I were, you would be worried about it too. It's easy to say stop worrying, but can I tell you, saying stop worrying will not help you stop worrying any more than saying stop thinking will help you stop thinking. It isn't going to happen, right? We have to continue to unpack worry further and further down the line. So why do we worry? It's in an attempt to create certainty out of uncertainty. Why do you worry about your kids? 
because they got a car and they left and you're not real sure what they're doing. Uncertain situation that you want to insert certainty into. Why do you worry about your grade? Because you don't actually get to read that paper and assign the grade to it. it. You're uncertain if you've met the expectations of that teacher or not. And I want to attach certainty in the midst of the uncertainty. Why do I worry about the perspective of my health? Because I'm not sure if I may wake up and find out that I'm sick tomorrow. I'm not in control of that, and I want to create certainty in the midst of that uncertainty. So somehow we've gotten it in our heads, my head included, that if I worry about it long enough and hard enough, all of a sudden some certainty will pop up. All of a sudden something will become true. And it's, it's extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. But as we're going to unpack not just the words of Paul, but also the words of Jesus, I want you to see this. Our situations can be bad. And things won't necessarily be fine. And we may have every reason to be concerned, but we don't have to worry. Okay, so let's unpack worry just a little bit more, okay, before we get to some practical things. Write this down if you're taking notes. This is important for you to understand. What you're most devoted to, you worry about the most, which is why it's so hard to stop worrying. If, if you're a devoted mother, you worry about your kids. That's why it's so hard to stop. If you're the one in your household in charge of finances, you worry about the finances, right? It's why it's so hard to stop. If, if you're a faithful employee that works hard and grinds every day, you worry about your job. It's why it's so hard to stop. It's difficult to stop worrying because that which we are most devoted to is what we worry about most. And here's the second layer to that. Your emotion drives your devotion. What you're devoted to, you're emotional about, right? You care about it deeply and passionately. That's why Paul's taking the time from a jail cell to write to a church that he cares about. He's emotionally connected and devoted to this church, so he wants to pin them and say, I'm in chains for Christ, and let me tell you all the incredible things that are happening, and let me give you all of this advice, because soon I won't be here anymore, so I'm going to share with you everything that I can. It's so difficult to stop worrying because our emotion drives our devotion and we worry most about what we're most devoted to. Our worry reflects our core devotions, but here, here's the big question then. What if you shifted your devotion? And, and for many of you, you're like, oh, are you saying that I, I shouldn't be devoted to my kids? No, I'm not but I'm saying you should be devoted to your kids after Christ. You saying I shouldn't be devoted to my marriage? No, not at all, but I'm saying you should be devoted to your marriage after your devotion to Christ. I worry about this church. Are you saying I shouldn't worry about this church? I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm devoted to this church, but after my devotion to Christ. Are you saying that I shouldn't be devoted to work? No, 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 but you should be devoted to work after your devotion to Christ. You see, when our priorities come into life, what, what's Paul say? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer, in supplication, in thanksgiving, go to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will come into your life and will be the gift that you receive from God, right? He's saying, listen, there's a priority. Worry about nothing, go to God with everything. In that priority, in, in that alignment with Christ, what happens is the peace of God supplements and replaces the worry that you have. Okay, I'm, I'm beginning to worry about my kids. I'm gonna go to God with my kids. I'm gonna say, you know what, God, I'm gonna pause right now. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna give it to you. And in that moment, the peace of God comes into my relationship with my kids and what's going on in their life. I'm worried about work. I'm worried about money. I'm worried about my marriage. Okay, I'm gonna take all of that to God. I'm gonna get to him first and foremost. And when I do, the prioritization of my emotions and my devotion replaces worry with the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Don't be anxious about anything. You're like, all right. So I worry about what I'm most devoted to, and my emotion drives what I'm most devoted to, and so my emotion can cause me to worry more and all of that, but I, I, still, I still need some legs. And so we're going to look in Matthew chapter 6, picking up at verse 24, and Jesus actually takes us on a journey, and he actually has a, a conversation about worry, and he has it within the context of money and the security that it brings, which is appropriate because one of the most worried about things for all of human History has been stuff, money, can we buy, can we get, can, can, can we receive, are we going to have enough? 
And this is what Jesus says. And listen, this is one of those passages that if you've been around church for a while, maybe you've read it. But I think it's easy to read it and just glance over it and not really let it sit and soak in our soul. So we're going to take our time for just a minute. And then I'm going to give you some practical things. It says this in verse 24. No one, that's important, right? No one, not anyone. I means you and I, you and I fall into no one. No one's exempt from this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the Greek word for money here is, is, is a word mammon, which really just means stuff, okay? It's not just dollar bills. You can't serve your stuff, your car, your house, your bank account, all of the things that you can collect of this world. And so if our devotion determines our worry points, then we have to ask ourselves, like, what am I most committed to? Because that's what I'm going to worry about the most. And so for many of us, we worry a great deal about money, which is why Jesus is saying this. But I want you to insert whatever it is you're worried about most. You cannot serve both kids and both God and worrying about your kids. You cannot serve both God and worrying about your job. You cannot serve both God and being consumed with any other thing that takes priority over him in your life. Let, let me illustrate to you what I mean by our devotion is what we worry about most. See, I don't worry about your job. I care about it. I want you to have a job. I care about you. I love you. I hope you make all the money you can possibly make. But I don't sit around laying in bed at night worried about your job. Why? Because I am not devoted to your job. I don't worry about your kids' grades. They're not my kids. Thank God. I can't raise my own. I care about your kids' grades, but I don't worry about them because I'm not devoted to your kids' grades. I'm not the one doing their homework with them around the table at night, getting frustrated because these worksheets in second grade already don't make sense. I got a doctorate and can't figure this stuff out, you know? I'm not worried about those things because I'm not devoted to them. So, so maybe money isn't your issue. Stick in whatever it is that you worry about that you're devoted to and understand you cannot serve two masters. There's a choice that we all have to make here. Am I going to be fully devoted to God, fully devoted to the glory of Christ shining through my life as Paul is, or am I going to be fully devoted to something else of this world? In verse 25, it says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Jesus is saying, listen, if anything else is your number one commitment, that will become your number one worry. We don't necessarily worry too much about food and clothing, but we do worry about our jobs, our advancement, our school, our grades, our retirement, whether or not we're ever going to make it to retirement, whether or not the stock market's going to iron out, whether or not the person we want's going to be enough. We worry about all of those different things. And then Jesus goes on to say this, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? I like, think about that. Isn't your life more than a job or getting into the right college or getting married or getting your kids into the right schools? Isn't life more than that when you really back up and remove yourself from that which is right in front of you and give yourself from some perspective and some opportunity? Are those things important? Absolutely. But are they everything in your life? No, not at all. Then in verse 26, Jesus says this, look at the birds of the air. Man, when Jesus writes stuff like this, it's almost frustrating, right? Jesus, I don't have time to be looking at the birds, man. Like, I don't have time to be bird watching, you know? I got bills to pay. I got a marriage th th to maximize. I got kids to worry about. I got a church to be, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap. Or store away in barns. Jesus is explaining the value of birds. He's like, listen, they're not actually building my kingdom. They're not making disciples. They're not spreading the good news of Jesus. And yet your heavenly father still feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? But Jesus, those birds don't have to retire. And the birds don't have to put a new roof on the house. And the birds don't have to make sure that their kid gets through third grade. Isn't that how we feel when we read 
things like this, like, but, but Jesus, they're just birds. My life's complicated, Jesus. So he goes on and says this. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then Jesus lays down the gauntlet. He goes straight to the heart of the issue. He says this, you of little faith. He draws this analogy that would have made perfect sense to the audience that he's talking to. And then he ends it with this, you of little faith. Are you going to have such little faith in me and who I am that it prevents you from being able to allow the glory of Christ to shine because you're so busy worrying? Okay, that's like the longest introduction to a sermon ever, right? We're only 10% through, all right? Just playing. We're almost done. So we, we're breaking down worry. So, so now let me give you some practical things, okay? Because it's, it's one thing to say stop worrying. It's another thing to actually find something that we can do, that we can believe, that we can say. If you want to stop worrying, you have to stop saying, I know God can, but I don't know if he will. Jesus says trust, right? He challenges us. He says, are you of little faith? He's asking the question to the audience. He's asking the question to us. And so many of us live in this place where we believe that God can, but we don't believe that God will. I believe God can heal somebody. I just don't believe that he'll actually do it. I believe that God could send revival. I just don't believe that God actually will send revival. I believe that God can build his church in today's time. I just don't believe that God actually will. I believe that God does restore marriages. I just don't believe that he'll restore my marriage. I believe that God can return prodigal sons. I just don't believe he'll return my prodigal son. I believe that God can give people a new job and make things like that are uber practical happen in people's lives. I just don't believe God will do that in my life. If you really back up and get honest about your faith, is that not where we live the vast majority of our lives as believers? I believe God can, I just don't believe he will. I believe God can do it. I, I just don't think he's going to necessarily right now in the time I want him to. Is that not the truth of your prayers? and the promises of God. You see them seven years later, they just didn't show up when you wanted them to, so now I'm not gonna give God any credit for it because he didn't show up when I needed him to. And it makes it extremely difficult to trust God. But can I tell you what trust really is? Trust is simply a pattern of identifiable behaviors. It's a pattern of identifiable behaviors that I see in someone else. I learned to trust them by identifying the pattern of behavior in their life. Are they consistent? Like, do they always show up? Then I know they're consistent. Do they always tell me that they love me? I know that they love me, right? It's a pattern of identifiable behaviors. Now, if I go to lunch with a guy every day for 30 straight days and he's always on time, always on time, always on time, always on time, and day 31, he happens to show up five minutes late. Am I now going to assume that on day 32 he's going to be late? No. Because the pattern of behavior says that this guy's on time. 30 out of every 31 days. Can I tell you that, number one, God is never late. That's just a percep perception that we have. But how is it that the one time that God doesn't show up in our life exactly when we want him to, we now all of a sudden reach this place in our lives where it's like, well, I just, I, I know God can, but he won't, not for me. He didn't show up when I needed him to. So I'll just go worry about it a little bit more on my own. Yet what's the identifiable pattern of behavior of God? He created us. He made us in his image. No other creature on this earth is made in the image of God. Just mankind. Think about that. 
And then we chose sin and created separation from the Father. So in all of his infinite love and mercy, he sent us his son to be a spotless savior, to die a miserable death, to cover us up so that we could walk in freedom and right relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. And then we get into this life and we have an opportunity to gather in his name and to celebrate him. And he sends people to support us and love us and care about us. And we go through the season and we pray for a spouse. And lo and behold, one shows up that happens to be godly and challenges me. Would you look at that? God did it. And then I pray, oh man, God, I need you to be in this situation. This job isn't going the way I need it to. And all of a sudden, that guy comes knocking and says, hey, would you like this other? job we go you know what maybe so would you look at that God did something it's incredible the pattern of behavior that is our Savior is one that is irrefutable so why do we live in this little faith that says I know God can I just don't believe he will I'll just go worry about it I'll just carry the burden I'll just take it and make it mine and some of us have more faith in our worry than we do in God We've reached this conclusion and this behavior that says that worry is going to shape our future. Like if I worry more, I'll have more hope. If I worry more, there'll be more change. And in times of uncertainty, we need two things. We need clarity and we need to know what to expect. And worry brings about neither of those, yet Christ brings about both of those. Charles Spurgeon put it like this, summarizes the whole point. He says this, I believe that the happiest of all Christians... And the truest of Christians are those who never dare to doubt God, but take his word simply as it stands and believe it and ask no questions, just feeling assured that if God has said it, it will be so. That's a whole mound of faith, right? That, that's, a, that's a faith that will stand strong and say the pattern of behavior that I see in my Savior says I should trust him in all times. Therefore, I don't have to worry. I just go to him in prayer. Write this down if you're taking notes. This is revolutionary. Worry is a waste of time. It's a waste of time. It can't add anything good to your life. So when you begin to worry about the future, you got to say, you know what, that's a waste of my life, and I'm not going to waste my life anymore. You know what the happiest animal on earth is? A goldfish. Its memory is only 10 seconds long. Every 10 seconds, that bad boy gets a new life. Every 10 seconds, it's just renewed and refreshed and full of hope and wonder. Once again, 10 seconds later, doesn't matter. That goldfish that you didn't feed for three straight days, he forgot. You're good. We got to live in a forward thinking mentality that says I'm not going to dwell on the circumstances that lead me to bitterness and pride, but I'm going to move forward in a faith that is active. Because here's what worry is. It's work that doesn't work. Worry paralyzes productivity. And listen, none of us like to work and then not receive any of the benefit of the work. My, my little girl, Ava, for her birthday, j- just back in July, my in-laws bought her this dollhouse, you know, because your, your in-laws think it's really funny to buy your kids' presents that come in 36,942 pieces and no instructions, you know? And they, all, the, all the grandparents in the room smile so big right there, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, listen, future son-in-law, yeah, I'm going to burn you down, brother. Just listen to me right now. I'm going to buy the most pieces in every box I can find. I'm going to cut up the instructions so you can never find them. And then I'm going to tell your kids that I'm smarter than you are and I could figure out how to put it together. That's what it feels like being a son-in-law. So she gets this playhouse, and she wants me to put it together, so I, I, I'm going to put it together for her. And so it's in all these pieces, and she's sitting there, and I love her so much, but she talks a lot, and so she's talking, right? So we're just, like, we're just, we're going along, and we're spending, you know, daddy-daughter time. It's easier with the boys, you know, you just yell at them, tell them to figure out how to do it themselves. But, you know, you'd be impatient, right? This is my little girl, and I'm going to be tender, and therefore. And so we get to the stickers. Mm-hmm, some of y'all know, Right? The stickers, 
Now, they don't paint anything on. That would cost too much money, right? They just send you a book of stickers that you have to miraculously figure out where to place. And good luck getting them straight, all right? They stick to your finger, then they get a, a crease in them, and then your daughter's upset. And it's a bad deal, okay? So I get to the stickers, at which point in time I realize that the, the initial piece I have the wrong way. And so the stickers won't go on the correct way, right? Again, this is where boys are easier because they're like, ah, oh, forget the stickers. Let's just play, right? But Ava's like, well, what about the stickers? So I have to take the whole thing apart just so I can turn it one direction, put it all back together so the stickers will go on the way that they need to go on. Can I tell you that when you worry, it's just like living with the base of your life turned the wrong direction. There may still be some good things built on top of it, but you get to the pretty part when it really matters and it's going to come together just like the picture showed, and you realize that I can't get there because I built on a foundation of worry rather than a foundation of faith. I was so worried about how everything was going to go, and I get to the end of it, and I realize the result isn't what I hoped it would be. I've got to get to that faith that says not only do I believe that God can, I believe that God will. I believe that he will show up. I don't have to worry about it. I can transfer it to him, give it to him, and watch him do what only he can do. So how do we really do that, though? This is how. We are to do all we can do and then rest in God's providence. So when you begin to go down the road of worry, you got to ask yourself, have I done all that I know to do? And when you answer yes to that question, you stop and say, you know what? It's time for God to pick up and do what only he can do. It's time for God to step into that situation and take care of what only he can take care of. If I've done all that I can do, then the question is, will I trust God to do what only he can do, or will I be of little faith? But how do we really get in that relationship of trust? Like, how, how do we do that? And I love Paul's writing that we open up with because he says, be anxious about nothing, but pray about everything. So notice the but is disjunctive. What Paul's doing is he's separating these two concepts, and he's saying, you got a choice. You can be anxious or you can pray. You can be anxious or you can pray. And then we say pray, and for some of you, that just seems like such a funky word. Like, I don't really know what that means. So, so, so let me break it down for you, because I want you to rest in God's providence when you've done all you can do. I want you to rest in who he is. I want you to rest in his promises. So the, the real key to prayer is it's just talking to God very openly and honestly. Use whatever language you use and whatever cadence you use for however long you need to. But there's a second part of prayer that we often miss, which is that we're also supposed to stop and listen. Everybody's like, man, I forgot that part. <laughs> Me too, all right? Sometimes we're really good at the, uh, I'm, I'm going to give God some direction. But I'm not always good at the, I'm going to pause and wait. And, and here's why this matters such a great deal. If worry is work that doesn't work, at the end of that, you're exhausted, right? By the time I took the playhouse all the way back apart, turned the bottom piece, put it all the way back together, and got the stickers on, I was wore out. My patience was gone, okay? I didn't need any more conversation with little sassy pants. All right? I didn't need one more. Are you sure that's where that goes? That doesn't look quite right. You got it crooked. Whenever you worry rather than pray, here's what happens. You get to the end of the day, and then the very last thing that you're going to do is you, is you want to be like, okay, so I spent 12 hours and 49 minutes worrying. I'm now going to pray for 36 seconds. Watch this trick. And we pray, but because we worried all day, we're now too fatigued to listen. We're too fatigued to pause for the moment that really matters in that conversation with God. Because what I have to say isn't the important part of the prayer. What he has to say is. So what Paul's saying is, you can worry or you can get in a conversation with God. You can worry or you can talk to God and listen. You can worry or you can maintain your energy for the one that genuinely matters. And when you do, what you will receive is the peace of God which transcends 
all understanding. You know, Proverbs 18 and 10 says this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. It's like the young pilot in flight school. He gets in the plane, it's time to land it. There's fog and there's clouds and it's gonna be his first instrument only landing. And the control tower can hear the worry in the young pilot's voice as he begins to shake and he's unsure and he can't see what's in front of him and he's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And the wise voice from the control tower says, son, it's your job to follow the instructions. I'll worry about the obstructions. And I believe that the strong tower, the control tower that is God, I believe he's looking down in our lives and he's saying, sons and daughters, it's your job to just follow the instructions and I'll worry about the obstructions. It's your job to just get to me and in exchange, I'll do the worrying and I'll give you the peace of God which transcends all understanding. It isn't your job to know everything and I understand you're on a journey and I understand you can't always see right in front of you and you're not sure how you're gonna land the plane and you're not sure what the next step is, but if you'll get in prayer and you'll talk to me and have the energy to pause and listen, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna give you the instruction. And then all you have to do is follow it because God is looking out for the obstructions in our lives so that we can live with the peace of God and not with worry. That's good news. That he loves us that much and that he cares about us that deeply. Heavenly Father, man, we thank you for your word and your truth. I thank you for this group and I thank you for just the opportunity for a moment of honesty and clarity in each and every one of our lives. God, I pray that every person in this room would just begin to process that which they're most worried about. God, whether it's kids or finances or finding a husband or making it through school or what job they're gonna take or what career path or what house they're gonna buy, like whatever it is, if the business is gonna be successful, if they should start that new journey, like whatever it is, God, I pray that they would just begin to identify that which they are worrying about uncontrollably. And God, that they would just begin to speak to you here and now in this moment, that they would understand that it isn't a pause and wait and get to some prayer time. No, in the moment of worry, we go to prayer. The moment of worry, we go to prayer. The moment of worry, we get to God. Everybody look up at me just real quick. I'm just a little different. Listen, Pastor Kevin's about to, to sing a song. I, I put an index card and a pen on all of your chairs and Here's what I want you to do. Just as he sings, I want you to just spend a moment praying. And I want you to write down what it is that you worry about the most. You, no identifiers. I don't need to know who wrote what. And I want you to just come up and lay them at an altar. Maybe you need to spend some time praying over that. Maybe you, you just want to drop it and you're good to go. You're, you're free to leave as he begins to, to pray. And then I, I want to just collect these up. And I want you to know I'm going to be praying over everything that you're worried about all week. Every bit of it. Because I believe that worry has taken so many of us hostage that the glory of Christ isn't shining through our lives in the way that it should. And you're like, this is silly. Just follow the instruction. And spend a moment in prayer rather than in worry and lay that worry down and let God take it and watch the peace of God fill that void love you guys with all of my heart. Let's lay these worries down.